Hi everyone, my name's Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer, and I'm here today to talk to you about all the books I read in January. Now, if you had asked me before I sat down to film this video how I felt about my reading in January, I think I would have been quite down about it, a little bit flat. But when I went to gather all the books that I want to talk to you about, I remembered <laughs> that I had read about four that I really, really loved, which is not bad going. There were just a lot of middling books in there too. However, I think a lot of that was to do with me and the month of January and external factors. And I think it's important to contextualize sometimes the time and place that we read something because it can have a massive impact on our enjoyment. I just think I was reaching for things in January that I thought were what I needed and then it turned out that wasn't quite the case. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about that as we go through this video because I don't want to be unfair on certain books. So some of them really weren't for me, no matter what time or place I went to them. In January, I read, I think, 26 books. About 10 of those were picture books that I read for the Inclusive Books for Children project. I'm a book reviewer for them. I will link their website in the description box down below. I'm not gonna go through all of those in this video. I'm gonna focus on the ones that I was choosing to read myself, but I have picked three of my favorites, which I'll mention towards the end. And I also read two other picture books, not for work, that I just bought because I wanted to read and had a really great time. So I'm gonna shout those out too. In fact, one of them I think is one of my favorite picture books ever and I just fell head over heels in love with it and would uh, yeah, like to share it and press it into the hands of many people. Let's go through these books in a bit of a chronological order. I will list everything that I'm talking about in the description box down below, any relevant links to reviews elsewhere, and any reading vlog links, because there is, I think there's only one, there's one reading vlog that I'll link in the description box down below for some of these titles. The first book that I read in 2024 was Patreon Book Club book, and that was The High House by Jessie Greengrass. This is a climate crisis novel, and it's the second book of hers that I've read. She's got three out, one short story collection and two novels. I have to say I preferred her debut novel, Sight, which I read when it was shortlisted for the Women's Prize a few years ago. That one was a book that defied genre in a way, and it was about medicine and motherhood and being a daughter and x-rays, as far as I remember, and I found it really fascinating and intricate. This is very beautiful in many ways, but it didn't all come together for me in the way that I had hoped. So this is about a place called the High House, which a climate scientist has been making and has been stocking for her family. This house is described as an ark. It's a place for the apocalypse. And this novel really is about a gifting of possibility of hope for the future from one person to another. And the person who's doing the receiving can't always see the importance of what is being given to them in the moment and that's something they reflect upon at a later date. Francesca has got two people to look after the house before her family go there to live. So this is also about found family because all of these people come together in the end and have to learn how to exist in each other's spaces. Grandy, who is one of the two people who's been tasked with looking after this house, is much older than the rest of the inhabitants and we're watching him age and his body change in the way that we're watching the planet age and change throughout the book. There are many time hops throughout and that means that the novel ends up feeling quite bitty, quite fragmented, almost as though a historian has come across this piece of writing or these pieces of writing washed up on a shore somewhere and then has tried to reassemble them and put them in some sort of order. So I thought that the, for want of a better word, messiness of the way that this book is assembled reflected the nature of what's going on in the book itself. One thing I wasn't sure about in this book is the two main female characters because their sections sounded so similar, I sometimes had to flick back to the beginning of a chapter to remind myself who was talking. So that's Sally, who's one of the people who's looking after the high house, and Caro, who is the stepdaughter of Francesca, who set up the high house. Perhaps this is a deliberate strategy, allowing these voices to feel very fluid, because this is about a flooding world. And I think there's a lot about this book that reminded me of Virginia Woolf's The Waves, which does have all of these disembodied voices and it is difficult to separate them. And at times you're not supposed to be able to at all. It means that all of the characters come together as a little bit of a choir, a chorus, in this case, lamenting the death of the earth. But 
I wasn't always convinced that it was deliberate and I think I would have liked a little bit more separation between those speaking parts. I would recommend this for fans of The End We Start From by Megan Hunter or even people who read The End We Start From and liked it but wanted more from it. That is a very, very short book. It's recently been turned into a film with Jodie Comer. It is another climate crisis novel set in a flooded world. It's about a woman who is trying to travel through this world with her very small child. The world building is quite thin on the ground and you can imagine a lot of the horrors that's going on. There's a lot of power in the unsaid, but it does mean you're doing a lot of work yourself. So if you read that book and thought, I like that, but I want a fleshed out version, I think that this would satisfy that want potentially. As I said, I read this for Patreon Book Club. So over on my Patreon, we read a book every season. And in 2024, we're gonna be revisiting some of my favorite books ever. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous about it to see if I still really love them and also if you love them too. And the first one that we are reading together is The Book of Strange New Things by Michelle Faber. So if you would like to join in with that, you can head over to my Patreon linked in the description box down below. And um, I also read this at the very beginning of the year, which is a board book called Electrical Engineering on Christmas by Ruth Spiro, illustrated by Irene Chan. Some of you may find this ridiculous, but I think it's kind of charming. This book is part of a series of board books for babies, which, has usual topics that you may expect to find in children's books like Christmas and putting up a Christmas tree, but also marries that with physics. So other ones in the series, we've got ones on thermodynamics, ones on gravity, one on coding. So this is about putting up a Christmas tree, yes, but about atoms and about electricity and understanding where light comes from. Obviously, these topics have been simplified massively and even in that state are not going to be digestible or fully understandable <laughs> for very young children. But it's more about getting kids to ask questions, getting them excited and interested and getting them to notice how complex the world around them is. It also uh, invites discussions around safety as well, which I think is a good thing. So yeah, I thought this was great. I just thought I would mention it because I read it, but I get that that's probably not gonna be for everyone. I've decided to carry over one book into February that I didn't get round to finishing, and that is A Sign of Her Own by Sarah Marsh. So hopefully I will speak about this in the not too distant future. But this is about a woman called Ellen Lark and about the invention of the telephone. Ellen is a deaf woman who was exploited by Alexander Bell who claimed to have invented the telephone. It's obviously her historical fiction novel and I will speak about it once I have finished reading it because I haven't read a huge amount. I started reading it at the beginning of January and whilst I was enjoying it, it just wasn't what I needed at that particular time. So I decided instead I was going to head to more page ternary books because that was what I had the urge to read. My phone has just gone off telling me that I need to go to a meeting. So I'm gonna go to a meeting and then we're gonna come back. I would have not mentioned that and just cut without telling you, but I think that the light may have changed by the time I get back. So I will see you in potentially different lighting in about half an hour. Well, for you, it's gonna be literally the next second. Be right back. I'm back. Has the lighting changed much? Hopefully not, but who knows, where were we? Okay, I was saying that I was carrying one book over into February, which is um, A Sign of Her Own by Sarah Marsh, just because it wasn't what I particularly needed to read or felt I needed to read in that moment. Um, I spent a lot of time in hospital in January, long waiting times, and I wanted to read something that was very page turnery, something that was very gripping. So I decided to do a themed reading vlog where I read lots of crime slash thrillers, and I'll link that video in the description box down below. I didn't wrap up the final book I read in that video because I was still reading it when I ended that video, so let me remind you of the books that I read and also talk to you properly about the one that I um, ended with. It's a very red and black pile here. The first one that I read in that video was Has Anyone Seen Charlotte Salter by Nikki French, which is their new standalone. It's out in February. It's already out in Europe and other languages, but it's not out in the UK until I think the end of February 2024. So you'll be able to get your hands on it in a few weeks time. This is a dual timeline book. Some of it is set in the 90s at a birthday party for the father of a family and the wife slash mother of that family doesn't turn up to the party. 
and is then missing, presumed dead. We're then following the same family 20 years or so later when a true crime podcast is investigating the unsolved mystery of their wife slash mother. This was very, very similar to their book, The Memory Game, which I read and really enjoyed. And I think it's one of their earliest books. They've been writing for decades, but it wasn't until actually I'd finished filming that video and I was thinking about it, like how many similarities there were between that book and this one, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but I think because I had read that one, I was able to make guesses about where the plot in this one was going that maybe I wouldn't have done if I hadn't read that one first. This is still a very good standalone from them, just not one of my favourites. If you are looking for a Jen stamp of approval standalone from Nikki French, my favourites are off the top of my head The Red Room, um, Losing You and House of Correction. Those I think would be my top three. Still enjoyed it though. After that I picked up The Night Visitor by Lucy Atkins and this one I decided to DNF. Maybe not forever but definitely for now. It just wasn't gripping me. There was something about the narrative voice that, I don't know, wasn't what I needed to be reading at that particular time, which I feel like is a phrase I'm going to repeat quite a lot in this video. You can probably tell that just during January I was searching for something to distract me and not always finding it, which, as I said, is not always the fault of the book, but this was a casualty of that, I'm very sorry, to this book. But then I read this, which I loved, and this was A Suspension of Mercy by Patricia Highsmith. This is a very meta book about an author who is imagining <laughs> a TV show where a man gets away with crimes all the time. So therefore he starts focusing on how one would get away with crimes. He doesn't get on with his wife very well at all. So he thinks, well, what if I decided one day that I would kill her? How would I get rid of her body? How would I go about doing that? And then his wife does go missing. And so the police are very suspicious of him understandably so. This is a blend, or could possibly be a blend, it's open to interpretation, of this story that's being told about this man, but also the story that he is writing within the context of this world. So you're never sure if what you're reading is the truth, as the novel would present it to you, or this man's version of the truth that he is fabricating for television. I thought that made it a really compelling read and quite unusual in many ways. If you want to hear my in-depth thoughts, you can head over to that video, which I'll link in the description box down below. After that, I then picked up Cut to the Bone by Alex Khan. One of you pointed out, because you went to go listen to the audiobook of this, that there is another book with a very similar premise with the same title, which is really bizarre. But anyway, this one is about a YouTuber, a vlogger called Ruby, who goes missing one day, and then a video is put up on her channel where she is asking for help. Obviously I wanted to read that because it's about social media, but I did go into this with some trepidation because if authors are writing about social media websites, YouTube in particular, things that maybe they don't have a huge amount of knowledge about, it can be done quite poorly given that I, and I'm sure many of you watching, know quite a lot about these platforms and the way that creators behave, the way the industry works. I wasn't always sold on his depiction of the vlogging world, but I was captivated for the first half of this book. The second half ran away with itself, got a bit ridiculous in places, and I found myself being tugged out of the story many, many times. There was also a problem with the editing in this book. There were quite a few spelling mistakes, which is not the fault of the author. It is the fault of the publisher, this all should have been caught, but again, that yanked me out of the story because I would stumble over sentences here and there, which was kind of frustrating. For the most part, this book was fun, though I did guess who had done the crime from a not so throwaway comment near the beginning of the book that felt glaringly obvious to me. It just ran away with itself a little bit in the end, got a bit too cinematic, a bit too unbelievable, but then, then and then, I read Pet by Catherine Chidgey, and I had a brilliant time. For years, I have been trying to find a book that gives me the same feeling as Notes on a Scandal by Zoe Heller, which is one of my favourite books, which 
I think it's still true, but you know when you haven't reread a book for ages and ages and ages? When I read it, it was one of my favourite books ever, and hopefully it would be if I read it again now. And I love the adaptation with Kate Blanchett and Judi Dench. I just think it's brilliant. This is the only book that I have read since that gave me the same feelings as that book and continued to do so throughout and didn't disappoint me. So that was really exciting. The plot of this is actually so different from Notes on a Scandal. So Notes on a Scandal is about a teacher, an older teacher, a woman who becomes very obsessed with a new teacher at her school. She's in love with her, she writes about her in a diary all the time, and she tries to manipulate this woman's life. And when I have read comparable titles in the past, it's always been about toxic women who are trying to manipulate friendships or twisted queer love stories. And that's not what this book is but the setting is the same. So this is also set in a school and it is about a teacher who enjoys picking pet students in her class and she knows that all the children are clamouring to be chosen. She enjoys the power that she holds over them and she will choose a different child and get them to do tasks for her, basically exploiting them a little bit, but the lines are so blurred, she gets away with getting them to stay behind, with getting them to go to the shops for her, to buy certain things, because the children are convinced that it's, because she wants to give them responsibility and she really respects them. Whereas as an adult reader, we can see that this behavior is not okay. I think that Catherine Chigi really encapsulates that feeling that you have when you're young, where you want grown-ups to treat you like a grown-up as well. And that makes it harder to call out abusive behavior, but also just manipulative behavior in general. This teacher is called Mrs. Price and we are following a student of hers called Justine. Justine recently lost her mum and Mrs. Price is almost trying to become this motherly figure, firstly in the classroom and then within Justine's life too. This is a dual timeline novel, so we are following Justine as an adult when she's looking after her father who has dementia, and then we're also following Justine as a child. There is a lot of imagery to do with time and being stuck in time or lost in time, and I really loved how all of that was woven together in this book, and I spoke about that in a lot more detail in the reading vlog, which I'll link in the description box down below. Something I don't think I spoke about in that video because it hadn't all come together yet is the imagery surrounding voice and who gets to tell a story. So in the past sections, Justine discovers writing around the house that her mum had left on the walls. She can shine a black light on it and see all these words which appear to be disappearing over time. So in this way, Justine can see an echo of her mum's voice, but she can't speak to her because she's no longer there. Justine has a favourite pen that she likes to write with and that goes missing one day. She thinks that Mrs Price has stolen it and this represents Mrs Price taking away Justine's ability to tell her own story, to be believed by the people around her. The pen, which is on the cover here, has a prominent role to play later on in the story and therefore this text is a representation of Justine reclaiming her story, piecing it all together and presenting it as evidence, if you like, to us, the reader, so that we can make our own judgment on what is going on and who we should believe. I thought that it was brilliant. After finishing that vlog, I decided to read one more thriller because I knew I was going to be at a hospital appointment for three hours one day and I just wanted something that was going to help pass the time. So I decided to read Judas Horse by Linda LaPlante. I used to read Linda LaPlante loads, I want to say 15 years or so ago, I used to get lots of her books out of the library. And I think on reflection, I feel the same now as I did then. I can be swept up in her stories, but they're always a little bit over the top. And there are often stereotypical things, especially to do with men and women that can be frustrating and make me yawn a bit <laughs> and make me not love the book overall. So this is the sequel to a book I read in a trying to find a new favourite thriller vlog last year. The first one was called Buried. Yeah. Um, and this is about a policeman called Jack War who is corrupt 
and his dad is potentially a gangster. I mean, you can see the direction that this kind of thing is going in. So he is trying to solve crimes, but also he's very rough and ready and he has contacts on the outside and, you know, maybe don't trust him. I, I think I would enjoy this more perhaps as a TV show. Maybe I would find it less frustrating, more believable if it was being acted out in front of me. To be fair to the book, the day that I read most of it, which was during that appointment, it probably did what I needed it to do. You know, it distracted me, even if it did annoy me at times. And I don't think my brain was really in a place to read something much more substantial. So I guess I will thank it for that, but I don't think I'm gonna continue on with this series and I wouldn't particularly recommend Recommend it. A couple of picture books I want to shout out before I talk to you about the last book I read in January. The three favourites of mine in January that I read for the Inclusive Books for Children project were You're Safe With Me, which is by Trisha Sunder and Poonam Mystery. I loved Poonam Mystery's previous illustrated book. Is it How the Stars Came to Be? I can't remember off the top of my head. I will put a picture here. I think I did prefer that one to this. The illustrations though are the selling points of these books. Both of these books incorporate Indian folklore and are just beautiful hypnotic bedtime stories that I think would have sent me to sleep in the nicest way possible, i.e. not boring, but are just so soothing. They would have sent me to sleep when I was younger. And in fact, I found them very comforting as an adult too. So if you're looking for something in that vein, I would recommend it. I also really enjoyed this, which is coming out in March. This is The Doll's House by Tanya Rosie and Claudia Rivali. This is about a young girl called Mia who's recently moved house with her mum and she doesn't know anyone in the new area yet. And she's walking home one day and she sees this abandoned doll's house. So she takes it home, leaves it outside her house and decides that she's gonna do it up. And this means all the local children become really curious and they come out to see the doll's house and it becomes this hub that they do up together and it's all about community and caring and all the different ways that children like to play and communicate and i just thought it was charming here is an example of the artwork inside and then this is listening to the quiet by cassie silver and Frances Ives. This is an own voices book about a young girl whose mother is losing her hearing and at home they're starting to learn sign language together and she's really proud of this way that she's communicating with her mum so she wants to give a presentation about it at school. I thought that this one was lovely as well. Let me show you what the illustration looks like. It's very gentle, the illustrations inside. It's not overly crowded, which I think reflects you know, the title, Listening to the Quiet, having space for calm and communication. Then, before I talk to you about the final book for Grown Ups that I read, this is the picture book that I bought, treated myself to, had nothing to do with work at all, and is now one of my favorite picture books ever. This is Dim Sum Palace by X Fang. This is about a young girl called Liddy, who is super excited, she can't sleep, because she knows that the following day she's gonna go to Dim Sum Palace with her family, and she's gonna eat all of this delicious food. So she dreams about Dim Sum and going to Dim Sum Palace, but in her dream, it's an actual palace and the chefs mistake her for food and nearly turn her into a dumpling, a Liddy dumpling, who may get eaten. The illustrations in here really remind me of Morris Sendak. I just think it is a brilliant balance of slightly twisted, could potentially have danger to it, is magical but also fun and will make you so hungry. This book made me so so hungry. I thought it was an absolute delight and I'm definitely going to be buying it for many people in the future. Finally, the last book that I read in January was this and I really loved this. This is A Woman in the Polar Night by Christiane Ritter. The subheading is The Classic Memoir of a Year in the Arctic Wilderness. I read this to review for Toast. They're a clothing company, but they also have an online magazine and I write an article for them every month where I go on a walk, read a book and write about both of those things. That article isn't live yet, so I'll speak about this briefly, but you can read that article when it's up. She was an Austrian writer. This is translated by Jane Degrasse. She was born in 1897, and in the 1930s, she decided to travel to the Arctic near Svalbard with her husband who was there for several years. And 
I was gonna say she didn't really know what she was getting herself into. I think she both did and she didn't. She took great pleasure in preparing for this expedition and buying lots of things that people told her she would need. And then she was infuriated because she got a letter from her husband saying, darling, I'm so glad you're coming. Don't pack anything that you can't carry in a rucksack. And don't worry, you won't get lonely because our neighbor is only 60 miles away and he's not even being sarcastic. I think this is the only book that she ever wrote or at least the only book that was ever published and it jumps around quite a lot obviously it's documenting the whole year so there are gaps but there are gaps outside of just time periods as well so for instance at one point she mentions how they left their daughter at home to come on this expedition and you're quite far into the book and then it's quite perplexing that she never really mentions her daughter again and he doesn't seem to ever talk about her either and also thinking about the time when they went on this trip so she left austria in I think it was 1933, 34 to go traveling. And she's encountering all this danger in Svalbard and all this uncertainty to do with the weather and the wild animals. But you know that back home in Europe, there are so many things going on and this element of danger that is escalating and escalating and is about to explode. And they have no knowledge of it because they're cut off from everything. They get their post once a year. My favourite thing about this book is the way she writes about nature and landscape. If you're a fan of Sarah Moss's Names for the Sea, then you need this in your life. Let me read you an extract. The sleeping, shining white fox fits in wonderfully with the stillness of the night, which still remains magically bright. Mikkel is like a fragment of the mysterious ice age, lying hidden in the frozen, quiet brightness. In the transparent heavens, the large moon looks quite near not as it does in Europe, where its light is cold and distant. Here, it seemed to belong to our world, the luminous picture of a sharply outlined ice landscape. Okay, the light is well and truly disappearing here, so let me wrap this video up. As I said, I will list the books that I've talked about in the description box down below. I would love to know if you have read any of these or if you're tempted to pick any of them up now that you've heard me talk about them. If you're new to my channel and you enjoyed this video and you would like to subscribe, that'd be very kind. If you like my content and you would like to consider supporting me on Patreon, that would be lovely. Link to that is in the description box down below. Patreon is a place where you can support creators whose work you enjoy. And the support that I receive over there allows me to keep creating free content for you all on this channel and also funds my time making it accessible by creating captions and all of that good stuff. I'm sending lots of love to you all. Thank you for joining me and I will see you for another video very soon. Bye.